it's recording everything. Um, and yeah, that way we don't have to worry about it later.
to simplify. So the Indian person will help you out. Alright, I'm actually going to have you wear two. Can I look at my mask? The little one.
will do a, I will do a very brief I will do a very brief introduction. Um, I think uh, there are few people uh, that we've had here visiting us that really don't need an introduction, but I'll do a brief one anyways. Um, uh, Dr. Noor Walka will be uh, speaking to us today about uh, National Institute of Drug Abuse Priorities and Research Areas. But I want to say a few things. I think there are few women uh, researchers and scientists that are more well known uh, and possibly nobody that is more well known in the world than Dr. Noor Walka. Uh, she spent her research career early on at Brookhaven National Laboratories. She single-handedly is probably the person that's responsible for us thinking of uh, addiction as a brain disease. Um, and she has published prolifically and in, in, in very high impact science uh, work even before she became the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse in clarifying the role of uh, areas such as the, uh, the uh, nucleus accumbens, uh, the ventral striatum and the dopamine system in, uh, in the role of addiction. And I think this work was absolutely critical and pioneering in helping us to recognize that, uh, that drugs of abuse um, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, disorders that are associated with, uh, with it are affecting the brain and are affecting the brain in profound ways. Since she's become the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse uh, in 2003, she has been really at the forefront on pushing the agenda on uh, the neuroscience uh, discoveries in drug addiction. Um, and there's so n there are numerous uh, uh, discoveries that she was part of and she continues to be part of. She really is uh, in many ways an out-of-the-box thinker in the terms of bringing other disease models into the addictive models. She's been at the forefront on helping us to understand that uh, obesity uh, may be a, a, a really a disorder of the brain rather than a disorder of the body. Um, and I think f uh, most recently, and something that has affected us most uh, uh, intensely, she has been the architect of the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. It was really her vision that made this study uh, possible. And she was very much motivated by the fact that uh, we really did not have prospective longitudinal follow-up studies um, of a cohort of individuals before they were ever exposed to uh, substance use. Um, and with a very strong emphasis on understanding what might these substances do to our brains, in particular uh, uh, cannabinoids. Um, so I'm very, very excited to have her here. I think it's, uh, it, it speaks to uh, a lot of folks here at LIBA that have done fantastic work that uh, she's coming out to visit us. And we're very much uh, looking forward to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Good everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I do want to thank Dr. Martin Paulos to give me the opportunity to come and visit this place because, of course, throughout uh, the years I've been very aware of his work and the work that has come out of the Lariate. So, but I never actually expected to be wow the way that I was. So it has been a fantastic morning, and I thoroughly enjoy what I've learned today. So what I'm going to be doing, and I'm always have someone that basically I'm very, very candid, so I say what my, my agenda is, and my agenda is to try to recruit you into thinking in other ways that you as an, and as an institute can, can help us advance the knowledge of some of the most challenging problems that we have in the, facing the nation with respect to drugs now and if we don't pay attention in the next few years. So let me start by actually discussing what you all are actually, where we're having this discussion yesterday, what you're all surrounded by, which is marijuana. Welcome to a marijuana world. And with these, uh, these changes in policies that are being driven by very, very aggressive advertisements, we're starting to see that many states uh, in the United States have legalized marijuana. There are 10 states that legalize it recreationally. And then there had, I don't know, more than 20 or 20 states that have legalized it for medical purposes. And if you look at what has happened here in Oklahoma, my God, I sort of, we were discussing that there's more advertisement here than you see in Colorado. And so even though it's medical marijuana, and we were sort of, Jennifer was saying, Nora, look, they have a, a happy hour marijuana. And I sort of said, <laughs> <laughs> marijuana, I have never seen the happy hour marijuana, so <laughs> marijuana, but this is a new, a new event and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I'm laughing, because, but, but it is a very serious issue, of course, 
because the, and I'm laughing because of the absurdity in terms of how the narrative has come around to make people believe that marijuana is uh, not just a non-harmful drug, but it cures a wide variety of diseases. That's the absurdity that's making me laugh, because there's absolutely no evidence, and yet it brings to light how aggressive campaign and advertisement can change norm, norms among people modifying their behavior. And that's what's, of course, very, very dangerous. We have been very concerned about this movement towards the legalization of marijuana. And like any other drugs, we're concerned in general, but particular concerns for us is what happens to uh, teenagers, children, or, or m a women that may be uh, smoking marijuana when they are pregnant. So young people have become our priority here. And we've been tracking down, actually, what happens with the prevalence of marijuana among teenagers and this is data from Monitoring the Future that surveys 46,000 kids, 8, 10, and 12th grade across the United States to see uh, their experience with marijuana in their life or, or regularly, as well as there's, there's norms towards believing that it's a safe drug or not. What we're observing, curiously, is that the use of marijuana, basically, uh, whether it's 8, 10, or 12th grade, the prevalence has not changed very much um, uh, throughout the past 10 years, even though there has been these major changes in legalizations that have resulted in significant increases in marijuana use among adults. No, not among teenagers, we haven't seen it. However, what we have seen is that it hasn't gone down, and, and I'll, I'll speak about this is relevant because the rest of the drugs in adolescence are going down. So alcohol is going down, tobacco is going down, cocaine is going down, heroin is going down, even though heroin is going up in the rest of the country. So we're seeing decreases in drug consumption among teenagers that are very, it's challenging the question, why is it that we're seeing decreases in drug use among teenagers, legal and illegal? And a very important uh, question, because if we identify what it is, then we can use that information for prevention. But, but marijuana is not going down. So you can say, even though the rest of the drugs are going down, marijuana is not. And I'm putting in 2018 the data for regular use of marijuana, which is basically daily use of marijuana, to know that 12 graders have as close to a 6% of them are using marijuana regularly. And because we know that uh, children that consume drugs are much greater risk of dropping out, we do come to realize that this basically may be an underestimate of the number of kids that are actually smoking marijuana because they maybe drop out and we're not surveying them. The other things that makes it too very, very dramatic as one looks at marijuana, this is data that we've been following now for many, many years to compare the extent to which uh, kids smoke marijuana versus cigarettes. And so if you were to have looked at it in 1980s and 1990s, you will have a much, much greater number in the 2000s of kids that smoke uh, cigarettes as opposed to smoking marijuana. But look at right now how it looks. For several years, there are many more kids smoking marijuana than cigarettes. And this reflects something that is quite wonderful, which is how, on the one hand, how successful we've been at decreasing cigarette smoking among teenagers. This has been, to me, one of the greatest success in prevention interventions that have been able to basically decrease more than half of smoking, or 70% decreases in smoking among teenagers in a relatively short period of time. So prevention works, but you have to actually do a, an approach to, to intervene in, in the prevention itself. It doesn't happen spontaneously. And the other issue that we need to concern with respect to what is going to happen with respect to marijuana, on the one hand, is it's going to stabilize at 6% daily use of marijuana? Is it going to go up? Well, the other aspect that we're observing, which is, again, a major challenge in changes that people are taking drugs, are electronic cigarettes. And vaping devices, like you will, have basically ta taken young people um, and embraced them, or the young people have embraced the technologies, and it just have gone like wildfire. So we started to monitor the, the use of electronic cigarettes in 2016 with monitoring the future. It's very, very recent, because this was not a problem. They didn't exist. And yet we've seen how rapidly these, uh, the use of these devices is increasing. And I'm showing you data here that compares 2017 to 2018. This is one year difference. And you can see almost doublings on the rates of these uh, electronic devices 
for basically in this case vaping nicotine and vaping cannabinoids and you can see uh, or basically just using flavors but we are seeing significant increases in the number of kids that now are getting exposed to nicotine not because they are using combustible tobacco because they are vaping and of course the concern there is that once they become addicted to nicotine because nicotine is highly addictive then that will make them at risk to transition on combustible tobacco. The other big challenge that we are observing is that the cartridges contain as much nicotine in one cartridge as you can have in a whole package of cigarettes. And because these kids don't have an ability to understand what are the doses that need to be treated, we're starting to see toxic reactions and emergency department admissions because of the consumption of huge quantities of nicotine. Similarly, with a, a THC, the cartridges can contain 90-95% of THC. So you are consuming this active ingredient of marijuana in a much more higher consent than you would do with combustible marijuana itself, which in turn is therefore a link with a higher risk of adverse events. So the concerns that we're observing is that unless we're able to control and regulate this electronic cigarettes among teenagers, this is, could actually lead to a, a massive increase in, the, in, in going back addiction to nicotine on the one hand, and also exacerbating exposure to cannabinoids. When we're speaking about cannabinoids, um, we also have to realize, and I basically, in speaking about marijuana and in speaking about uh, Oklahoma, that even though you can divide the states that have legalized it for recreational versus medical marijuana, the way that the states are legalizing, it varies enormously. And we were speaking about the energy here in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, the legalization of medical marijuana seems to me just a justification to get your own marijuana prescription, but there's much less regulated than what you can see, for example, in a state like New York, where the marijuana prescriptions are very, very closely monitored. So this, for us, is an opportunity to understand how different policies are going to be influencing the consequences of exposure to marijuana. Uh, in the other thing that we need to consider when we are discussing marijuana, and it will be interesting to get a sense about what are the products that you are getting here in Oklahoma, is that the content of 9-THC, which again is the active ingredient of marijuana that is responsible for making you high, and that is the responsible for its addictiveness, has been significantly increasing. So neither does the analysis, the pharmacological analysis of the content of the cigarettes that, or the marijuana plant that is basically recovered by the DEA. And we analyze it for them. And you can see that whereas in 2000, when there's actually, that's not so long ago, the content of the marijuana may have been something like 5%, now we're at 16%, so that's threefold the content of 9-THC. So what are the consequences of having a THC that has higher content? Much more likely to have negative effects, side effects, and much more likely to actually result in addiction. And, and in blue, you see the cannabidiol, because that's the other aspect that we, when we're discussing and we're having the dialogue of marijuana, but, uh, a lot of the work that has been shown, potential therapeutic effects, emerges from CBD. There's some work also that indicates that THC on some certain instances may be, for example, beneficial for as an analgesic under certain instances. But most of the work with therapeutic effects has been documented by CBD. And perhaps in some instances, again, I'm going to say combination of CBD with THC may be optimal. But the evidence is not there solid enough for actually for us to be able to know to actually what to recommend and to actually personalize that intervention. There's absolutely no evidence. Uh, in there. There is data for CBD and as you know for uh, the uh, potential therapeutic benefits for the management of uh, um, epi pediatric epilepsy, Dravet and Lennart syndrome and, and that got approved by the FDA by, uh, on a product that was developed, Epidiolex by GW. But there, other than that, the evidence related to therapeutic benefits of marijuana has been limited and if you are actually uh, look at the literature critically, I would say, I think that there, the data is quite strong for spasticity, alleviating spasticity, 
quite strong for, for perhaps a certain analgesia, not all of the analgesic effects, but some, some effects on analgesia, and now send as an anti nausea medication. And also, perhaps, there's, there's some evidence that it does decrease the, um, the, the, the pressure in your eye, uh, but it is basically does not improve its function. So they are, uh, if you have glaucoma, you're much better off taking medications other than marijuana. But this does, of course, not permeate in any of the state's regulations of medical marijuana. And if you go to, and it's actually interesting to look at it because it can make you laugh. If you look at the indications of marijuana by the different states, you can see that all of them indicated for pain. That's a common one. But then there's tremendous variability, and you see that it's indicated for a wide variety of cancers by many states. It's indicated for Alzheimer's disease. Not to say that marijuana interferes with your memory processing and learning. So if you already have cognitive impairments, this may not necessarily be the most therapeutically <laughs> beneficial event. <laughs> be it as it may, this is how the, the, the whole field and industry is moving. And unfortunately, the train has left the station, and here in Oklahoma, it's going very, very fast. I think that, again, behoof, and I'm bringing it up in terms of the opportunity to do research and understand what are the consequences that this policy that you have here is having as it relates to the consumption of marijuana across populations, and what are its consequences uh, in psychiatric diseases and other substance use disorders, as well as medical illnesses. So I, here you have, this is the data from SAM, SAMHSA, and SAMHSA surveys individuals that are 12 years or older. So, and, um, and you can see that exactly like what we observe between 12 and 17, uh, and that's data from 2015, 2016, and 2017. So you have three years. There's no difference in increases in adolescence, which is like we observe in monitoring the future. But in three years, you see a 10% increase in the use of marijuana among 18 to 25. So in 2017, 7.6 million um, young adults in our country are consuming marijuana. That's 22% of that population. 22% of young adults are actually consuming marijuana. And that's Pasmon marijuana, so that's a recent marijuana. And when you look at the older population in three years, again, we're not speaking about 10 years, this is three years, you're seeing a 23% increase in the consumption of marijuana as assessed by Pasmon use. And I would wonder to see, and I would like to see what happens now by what has the prevalence rates of marijuana use in Oklahoma as a function of its legalization. We have other states that have been in this before, before, before all of you have been here, uh, in terms of these marijuana laws, and this is data that came from a, a, a San Diego County um, hospital that has one of the largest emergency departments. And as you know, uh, California, this started with medical marijuana, but it also had a very free policy. You could go in Venice Beach, and they had a whole series of stores. I was walking around, and the first one was $50 for a prescription, and then I walked a little bit further down, and it was $40 for a prescription. And then I tried to take a picture to actually show my colleagues that there were these prescriptions, and the doctors were in their green coats, and they threw me away. <laughs> so I don't have a picture of the, <laughs> the prescription marijuana for $40. So I mean, just actually you get a prescription and then you can go and, and fill it up wherever you want to. So, but, but I bring it up because they're a very open, liberal way of pre giving prescriptions for marijuana really gives them many years of exposure to wide availability of marijuana. And this is their emergency department visits with cannabis-related diagnosis in San Diego County. And so over a period of eight years, eight years, they've seen an 830% increase in emergency departments. And it follows, and again, again, why, why I bring up in terms of what you being alert about the negative consequences, the most frequently associated complications associated with the use of marijuana are related to psychosis because individuals do not know how to treat the doses. They consume a product that may have very high content of 9 THC. They will become psychotic. Mm -hmm. 
most of the psychotic episodes in terms are sort of l um, limited time, but some of them are very long lasting. And, and a big question that we have not yet resolved is the extent to which the use of marijuana uh, ex uh, extended a greater number of people with higher containing THC can result in an increase in chronic psychosis like schizophrenia. There's also been uh, uh, identifications of, of medical conditions that we did not know existed. I mean, a perfect example is uh, hyperemesis, where the consumption, the chronic consumption of marijuana of high content 9-THC results in a syndrome of very severe abdominal pain and constant vomiting that cannot be controlled. You end up in the emergency department because it becomes an emergency. You cannot stop vomiting. That is a syndrome that was described in, I think, in around 2006, 2008. We didn't know about it. And now there are other uh, clinical presentations that involve cardiac or pulmonary symptoms that may, in fact, turn out to be associated just like with uh, hyperemesis that we do not know about. And last night at dinner, we were discussing the notion, too, that has emerged already in several epidemiological studies, prospective studies that, in fact, have seen an association between marijuana use, uh, particularly among young people, and suicidality, suicidal uh, ideation, and suicidal actions. Uh, perhaps, as uh, we were discussing it yesterday, last night, too, perhaps through an impulsive, um, impulsive phenotype making these individuals perhaps either paranoid or impulsive or disrupting processes that leads them to take action that results in suicide. Now, this is what we are observing, and what we don't know is what we basically have not had enough time to look at. And to me, one of the main concerns when it relates to marijuana is what are the, is going to be its potential negative effects in the human brain, in human brain development. Why? Because the endogenous cannabinoid system, we know, plays an extremely important role in brain development. It emerges during the first trimester of uh, fetal development, and it is implicated in process as fundamental as migration of neurons uh, during these early stages to formation of synapses and, and actually, uh, I mean, ultimately setting them into functionally active synapses. So because of that, I mean, sort of, uh, and that we're playing with fire by providing and exposing so many people to marijuana at very high content, our concern was, what is this going to be doing to young people whose brain is developing, where they actually are going to be manipulating this unendogenous uh, cannabinoid system and disrupting it? What are its consequences? Now, it may be that its consequences are really nothing to worry about. But, uh, and that would be great if we don't have anything to worry about. And I always said it, it would be fantastic if indeed marijuana could make you feel groovy and happy. And <laughs> then on top of that, it basically prevents you from Alzheimer's and cures your pain. And, it's not, and then you don't have problems of addiction. It would be fantastic. But we know in biology that any drug that we provide that manipulates the reward system, that resets certain actually processes um, link with anxiety or analgesia, that we basically adapt to it and, and, uh, and either decrease or downregulate the expression of proteins that are signaling through those systems, through receptors, or we actually downregulate the synthesis of endogenous peptides or neurotransmitters that are involved with those systems. So we know that that is a classical signature of what happens in biology. So what if it, if it doesn't happen for marijuana, it would be an extraordinary finding. But on the other hand, if it does happen, we need to understand what is its consequences. And that's, that, that, that recognition that we need to understand whether marijuana is harmful to the young brain or not was what led me to speak with George Cuban. I said, George, George is the director of the National Institutes of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. And I said, you know, this is the time that we should actually do a study that has sufficiently power to address the question of whether marijuana is harmful to the adolescent brain or not. And there's a lot of studies that have been done that have shown that you are smoking marijuana, your cognitive performance is lower as a teenager than if you are not. Also, if you're an adult and you're smoking marijuana regularly, your cognitive performance is going to be worse. 
But there's been two questions about it. One of them is the question of, is this just uh, acute? So when you are at stone, you cannot learn very well. Yes, that's acute. The issue is, does it, it last longer? And, I, and we don't know that if it lasts longer, but if you are studying and you are in high school and you are supposed to basically pass an exam and on the weekend you were stoned, so you failed the exam, that has a cumulative effect that ultimately could interfere with your educational development, even though the memory systems may recover. And I don't know that they recover or not, but, but again, it is, I'm bringing it up because regardless of whether it is long-lasting changes in the hypo hippocampus, assuming that that's where our memory impairments from marijuana is coming, or it's just temporary, but it's disrupting your, your career and performance in school, both of them days are very, very negative. So I said, yeah, that's one of the, the criticisms. The other criticisms that all of these studies have had, it says, yes, you have lower, lower IQs and lower cognitive performance, but could it be that those teenagers already had those um, predisposing factors that led them to consume marijuana? <laughs> such that their low cognitive performance is not a function of exposure to more marijuana, but something that makes them more vulnerable. And I think that that is a valid question. And I, while there are some studies to suggest that, uh, in fact, that there may be some causality with it, the sample sizes are not large enough, and they are not well controlled. And then there are other studies that show the opposite. And so the same thing with imaging. You have studies that show that if you get exposed to one, a dose of marijuana, your brain actually shows morphological changes. Whereas then there are others that said, no, the morphological changes that you're observing with marijuana are a result of adverse environments or genetic components and vulnerabilities. So that's where I saw it, said, okay, George, this is the time, let's do a very, let's be bold, let's actually propose to do a large study prospectively to evaluate what are the consequences of drug exposures on human brain developmental trajectories. And by the way, such a study would be extraordinarily valuable to generate uh, standards about what is normal human brain development, which we don't have. And to me, right now that we have that technology, it was a non-brainer. And so, yeah, it was a non-brainer. I mean, we have had the standards for weight and height for children for how many years, right? And we have had these technologies now that make it possible Plus, we also have developed the database infrastructure that enables us to collect data from multiple sites and also to bring data together and make it available for researchers to take advantage of the complexity of these data sets. So the time is now. And uh, George embraced it. So we partner with uh, the, also the Cancer Institute to a certain, because it's basically involvement in, in their interest in cigarettes as well as the NIMH, the Child Institute, and um, the Environmental Institute, and the Office of um, Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, and uh, the Center for uh, Studies on and Women Health. And this is, that's how the ABCD was born, and you have actually been uh, basically one of our stars, star researchers. So it brings multiple sites to work together, and um, of course, uh, and we're very grateful. And today I was uh, visiting the ABCD site at the Laureate Center, and I actually wanted to regress into my infancy so that I could become one of the subjects that's playing around <laughs> with all of the, the nice toys and, and candies that you have. They did give me a candy. <laughs> <laughs> but the study has, as of now, been, uh, for me, uh, directing an institute for so many uh, years, I can tell you, this is the best managed study I've ever seen in my life. And the, the study is on track. They basically recruited close to 12,000 individuals. The data uh, for the first uh, group of subjects, the 12,000, has been released. Um, there has, it's, uh, from the inception, the whole concept has been, it's open access. We're going to be holding um, a, a session at the Society for Neuro Neuroscience to, to teach um, neuroscientists how to take advantage of this database so that we want the database to be used. And so, and it is now uh, serving us to give us, to guide us of uh, if we are actually able to do this study starting at age 9 to 10, 
should we start earlier? And I knew very well that the human brain does not start at age nine, of course, and that the adverse effects of environments do not start at age nine. I knew, I knew that infancy was fundamental. But there was such an urgency to try to get data that pertains to the responses of um, the human brain to adolescents, exposure to marijuana, that that's why we selected nine to 10 years of age. Now that the study is ongoing, we're going back and say, can we now inst start the infancy so that we can build up the whole developmental trajectory? And I'll speak about that at the end. So this is what I want to say about marijuana, and I want to speak about actually vaping and electronic cigarettes, and I think extraordinary opportunity for research. But the second part of my talk, I want to address it for the opioid crisis, because of course, this is a whole horrific crisis that is killing thousands of individuals in the United States of all ages, of all ethnicities, of all socioeconomic backgrounds. It's been devastating. And it's also a crisis that we started in the healthcare system. And as such, to me, we have a tremendous responsibility to actually stop it as soon as possible, but to learn from it so that we don't do it again. And, and two, the other uh, component of it is that uh, apart from everything, we have, uh, the Congress has allocated in 2018, uh, they allocated $500 million annually to address science that will solve the opioid crisis. So I want to tell you about it so that you can see ways in which you, as investigators, can contribute to advance uh, some of this research and take advantage of these grant opportunities. <coughs> these are numbers that you have seen now, uh, I'm sure, this, this slide, actually, that I took from Tom Freedom. He was presenting one by one the geographical changes. And I said, OK, Tom, give me your slides. And I did this slide from 1999 and to 2015 at that time. I just did two of them because it was very, very adamant. This is 2016, and I have, haven't been able to get that 2017, which is very unfortunate because it takes some, too much time to get data back. And I think that that's an area that would be very valuable if we could get more up-to-date data. Bottom line, you're seeing mortality per 100,000 individuals associated with overdoses. And you can see over a period of 17 years how the United States has covered itself all throughout. And, and, and interestingly, because it's actually, certainly Oklahoma has been affected, but overall, with respect to the opioid, the, the main, the main uh, hubs that started the whole problem were, were in the Appalachia region, you see it even in 1999, and in New Mexico in 1999, and those have just grown and grown and grown and grown. And this whole the de sort of tsunami of deaths has continued. Hopefully, it looks like uh, the data for 2018 seems to show that there may have started to decrease. But um, as of now, all of the official numbers have not been able to show that there is decrease. In fact, we've seen increases. What is driving the, our inability to address this, uh, to contain the deaths? Well, we knew that the, we knew we know that the prescription opioids, the over reliance on prescription opioids for the management of pain, and very very aggressive practices by pharmaceuticals to actually promote these drugs as safe in ways that you could increase the the doses without f being afraid of respiratory depression because you become tolerant. They also um, basically provide these medications without fear for addiction because if you have pain, the notion was you would not get addicted. And then again, very strong practices, just like with the marijuana. I mean, again, we're replicating history. You have no real data and then you convince everyone that marijuana is safe. Well, the same thing happened here. With no data, they convened the, the, the field. And these were healthcare providers that knew better. We knew the pharmacology. We knew that opioids could produce overdoses at a relatively low index ratio, so that they are dangerous. We knew that they were very addictive. And yet, despite that, through advertising, we were convinced otherwise. And so that resulted in massive prescriptions of opioids in 20, in 2011, when we had the peak number of prescription of opioids, there actually was something like 225 million prescriptions between hydrocodone and oxycodone in this country in that year. It was just massive. And I recall, and I saw it immediately when I became director in 2003, they were showing me data monitoring the future and showing that 10.5% of teenagers were consuming Vicodin. And, and I said, wait a second, guys. 
what does this mean? I couldn't believe it. I had never seen teenagers take opioids in my life. And, and that's when I started to follow the track. And I kept on speaking with my colleagues at the NIH, other agencies. We have a problem, we have a problem, we have a problem. And, there was, and, I, and the Surgeon General actually was very receptive. Carmona and says, we need to come up with a call of action. Let's contain the, the prescription opioids. Unfortunately, he, he stepped out and, and, and this, this never happened. And so many years happen until people realize, someone, one of these journalists that came up and says, there are more people dying of prescriptions than car accidents. And that metaphor woke, I think, a lot of people up and said, oh my God, this is very, very serious. And since then, I, I would sort of say that took around 2009, 2010, that people have started to realize that we cannot continue prescription practices of opioids the way that we have, and they also have come to realize another thing, that we cannot continue stigmatizing addiction as a criminal behavior, as a moral failure, uh, as opposed to a, a, a disease. So, so that's where these two, uh, this, this tragedy, it has actually led the American public and the healthcare system and the policymakers to realize we cannot continue doing things the way we are. So what is, um, that is uh, led to the decreases in, in the green, uh, very, very uh, uh, active uh, education to decrease the number of prescription of opioids. And you can see them stabilizing around 2011. And now there's basically in overdoses, you see that there's basically there are no more overdoses increases, they are stable. But then the heroin came into the, into the country, it came predominantly from Mexico, very, very high purity, very, very low cost. And as people became addicted to prescription opioids and prescription opioids became harder to get and they became tolerant to prescription opioids, they shifted to pure heroin. And you can see the steep increase happening on overdose deaths from heroin around 2010, 2011. Those have stabilized, which is the good news. And in fact, there may be some evidence that heroin deaths are going down. But then look at the black line, the synthetic opioids. And again, this is where technologies and advances in chemistry not only stopped for us in pharmaceutical industry, but went into the illicit manufacturing of these drugs. Uh, the most frequently associated uh, synthetic opioid, illicit synthetic opioid with overdoses is fentanyl, though there are many others that are, are being identified, including carfentanyl, which is the most uh, potent um, opioid agonist that we know of. So we, what we can observe is that from being for many, many years, and 20, even in 2011, where we have something like 3,000 people dying from fentanyl and its analogs, in 2017, there were 28,000 ninefold increases in deaths from synthetic opioids. And this is actually just reflects the fact that synthetic opioids started to appear lacing, lacing heroin and lacing uh, illicit prescription opioids. And that has been the main, main challenge that we have had in our country to actually decrease and why instead of decreasing, the number of deaths has been rising. So how do we uh, then conceptualize this? And neither had conceptualized this from, from that, because we, were, we have been aware of this problem for, for many, many years. And so when Francis Collins called me, I think it was in 2016, and says, Nora, what are we doing with respect to the opiate? How do you see it? I said, well, there are two components to it. There's a component of pain, that's a reality, and there's a component of the addiction itself. And they are intermingled. And these two reflect areas where there has been a neglect in the healthcare system and in many instances also by research institutions. In pain, we have become very complacent and the uh, pharmaceutical industry, while at one point was investing significant amount of money in the development of analgesics that were not based on opioids because they knew they were addictive. I mean, when I was in medical school in the 70s, uh, beginning of the 80s, it was clear that there was a lot of interest on developing medications, analgesics that were non-addictive. And that's, I mean, I know because I was volunteer as a medical student in a pharmacology laboratory to do that. Can we get an opioid drug that is non-addictive? And um, uh, millions, millions of dollars went into it with no success. And so that at the same time, and again, I'm not cynical, but if I am one of these rich people that has one of these pharmaceutical industries that's producing these opioid drugs and are making billions of dollars, why would I want to invest 
in developing an analgesic that's going to compete with my own product. And again, and I bring this up because there is a system, it's not just the pharmaceutical industries that we point at them, they were very aggressive, but there was a system that allowed that to happen. And I think, and I bring it up again, because if we don't recognize where our mistakes came around, and we just want to make it very simple and blame one person, then we will not be able to prevent these things from happening. We, as a society, uh, if we learn from it, recognize that we actually should create systems that do not promote these um, marketing, marketing benefits where you actually have uh, an industry that no longer is incentivized in producing new medications. So we need to actually develop research that gives us better understanding of how to properly manage pain and develop new treatments for pain. While at the same time, we need to do interventions to prevent and treat uh, opioid addiction. So the NIH uh, now, as a corporate, not just NIDA in its isolation, has generated a set of goals in the, in the way of what, uh, how those $500 million are going to be managed um, and, and invested on. Half of the money is going to go to projects that are related to pain, and the other half is going to go into projects that are related to uh, opioid addiction with, of course, an interest of also of addressing the intersection of individuals that have pain and are also addicted to their opioid medications, and to also understand the, the commonalities that may relate to the very basic neurobiological processes that accounts for chronicity in addiction and chronicity in pain. So there are many, many opportunities, very extraordinary, interesting science. In the pain, and I'm not going to be dwelling very much about it, uh, the, the investments are going to go into generating predominantly a series of clinical networks that will enable the accelerated testing of new molecules for management of pain or of molecules for which there is already pilot data to bring them into phase two or phase, phase two, phase predominantly phase two clinical trials in partnerships, of course, with pharmaceutical industry. There's also going to be um, a clinical network to evaluate uh, comparative effectiveness of interventions that may not be uh, medication-based, such as, for example, meditations or acupuncture of these comprehensive approaches for managing pain. There's going to be also that network engaged in the development of biomarkers that can help us identify, and again, putting it in your brains, biomarkers, uh, for pain that can help us identify diversity of pain syndromes that can help us predict which patients are going to respond to what medications. And I think, again, where some of the work that you are already doing with, uh, in, in the projects on, on brain imaging may be extraordinarily valuable. In the lower part of, of uh, the whole the addiction, the way that I basically, in terms of view it, is Number one, the, in terms of the investments, we're putting approximately $100 million annually for accelerating the development of medications for opioid use disorders. That's one. We're putting also um, $100 million in implementation projects that instead of just looking at isolated interventions, bring them together in a battery of integrative approaches, in a very, very bold approach. We're also investing in the development of, uh, of interventions for addressing uh, opioid use disorder in justice settings and for addressing opioid use disorder in healthcare settings, including primary care, emergency, uh, emergency department, and gynec obstetricians, among others. So for medication development, what are the issues? If we had a current crisis as we have it, with a drug that was not opioids, but something like methamphetamine or cocaine, we would actually be in even worse uh, shape than we are. And that's because we have very, very good medications for the treatment of opioid use disorder. We don't have many. We have three of them. So if you compare, we have very, very good antiretroviral medications. How many we have? I mean, tens of them. Even antivirals, we have more for a, uh, hepatitis C. We have more than 30 of them. But let's say I'm not going to complain because we have three very good medications. But I do highlight this to actually bring forward how different we've dealt with the issue in the management of addiction versus other diseases. I'm very grateful for these medications. But I also want us 
to bring forward the concept that we could also benefit if we have more medications. So we have methadone, we have buprenorphine, we have naltrexone. These three pharmacological types of uh, drugs, these pharmacological drugs, target all of them the myopioid receptor with different properties. Methadone is full agonist, buprenorphine is partial agonist, and naltrexone is an antagonist. On top of that, both buprenorphine and naltrexone are also antagonists of the kappa receptor. And the antagonism of the kappa receptor is very relevant because it is associated with a negative emotional state of addiction in general. So for many, many years, NIDA has spent millions of dollars to try to develop drugs that are antagonists for the kappa receptor. Well, it so happens that buprenorphine and naltrexone are kappa receptor antagonists. And so it is very likely that some of its therapeutic benefits relate to these effects. Every single study that has shown has shown significant benefits of, of every parameter that you can look at. And, and, and even very notably, these medications prevent people from dying from overdoses. So if you're on medication, you're 70% less likely to die from an overdose than if you're not. If you're on medication, you're much less likely to get infected with HIV or to get infected with hepatitis C. You're much less likely to actually, if you have HIV, you're much, you basically are much more likely to be viremic free. So every single, you're much less likely to infect someone else because you're much more likely to comply with your antiretroviral medication. So every single parameters, and there are multiple studies that have shown it, so it's not one or two. The effect sizes are large. The National Academy of Medicine and Sciences, NASEM, did a report and evaluated and said the evidence is very, very high. It saves lives. It's basically malpractice not to provide these medications. But we don't provide them. I mean, the problem, so here we have another instance where we treat addiction differently. We don't provide them. Many of the treatment programs in the United States actually don't provide medications. And if they provide medications, they may provide one medication, not, not actually personalizing it to what may be best for the patient, just one medication. And also, basically de defining it as a sort of a limited amount of time to get on the medication when there's no evidence that shows that you have to be on a limited amount of time. So there's multiple barriers. That's one. And then there's another challenge with these medications, that you give the medications and, and within six months, 50% of patients will relapse. So we need to actually, if you look at it from that perspective, this is where I point. I mean, in my view, it says, okay, we're going to be funding $100 million extra for medication development. So one of the, the simpler ones, what is it that we can do to improve compliance so that the patients don't stay taking the medications and then they relapse? So if we want to improve number of people retained at six months, make extended release formulations that you don't make a decision one day because you didn't sleep well and you got into a fight with your spouse and you stopped taking your medicine. Get injections that last a long time. And these have been shown on every single medical con uh, condition to improve outcomes because of the issue of compliance. So what we are promoting in terms of this uh, respect is very much extended release formulations for buprenorphine. We've partnered with several pharmaceuticals for this. We have partnered, partnered with Alchemist for naltrexone. We're partnering with other researchers to develop, actually it would be fantastic to have a three-month naltrexone that would even improve outcomes. And we basically have currently, I think, two, two grantees that are developing an extended release formulations for methadone. The other aspect that we're working on is, um, well, we, we have these medications, if we can impl improve compliance. The other thing too is, um, because the, the treatment programs, they are not sufficient to provide them, um, how do we, ex we expand? And that's where we come around of uh, funding researchers to develop models and provide the evidence that shows that one can treat um, and screen and treat opioid use disorders in healthcare settings and that they are sustainable, those interventions. Multiple researchers have published already on this, and this is uh, to the left, a study that was done in um, uh, primary care physicians, um, which is the office-based uh, administration of buprenorphine, which actually is much simpler than a much lower threshold. You don't need to have all of the social support systems that normally uh, specialized treatment programs require. And even though one can make an argument that it's ideal to have this and that and the other, we also have to recognize that in some instances, that ideal world doesn't exist. And that we kill the bird just fighting for perfection. So 
and, and I think that this data shows clearly what you see is before the initiation of the office-based buprenorphine in different um, primary care settings, and then the first six months and the subsequent six months in that particular year. And you can see the number of emergency room admissions per OBOT enrollment went basically less than half. And this is with minimal social support. So if you add on top of that personalizing behavioral interventions and psychiatric support, you can see that you can probably improve this. To the right also a study that I, I fell in love when I, I basically read it, which is the one of Gail Donofrio, which shows that very simple intervention, initiate buprenorphine in the emergency department. You have an attentive patient. You are in the emergency department. This is a life-changing event. So just initiating buprenorphine then, as opposed to referring them to treatment, significantly improve outcomes. And I heard that there are some projects like this actually being tried perhaps in the States. I, I actually, we are funding a very large network of emergency departments to try to understand what are the barriers and what are the optimal ways of initiating uh, buprenorphine in emergency departments. One of the things that we now currently have, for example, is we have an, uh, uh, the possibility, there's a drug that has been approved, but it's right now on hold, a one-week buprenorphine uh, formulation that may actually be, have many advantages for an emergency department setup where giving a one month may be too long, and so an intermediate level. So we're interested on, on testing these alternative formulations in the emergency department. And I told you the other one that we are expanding research and development of models is the justice setting. And this is an incredible opportunity that we have to change the way that we treat addiction in our country, that we're criminalizing it. I mean, so when do you put someone with diabetes in prison or jail because they ate a donut? I mean, I think, I mean, I, I mean it is. I mean, you are uh, penalizing someone for a behavior that they cannot control or regulate. So why, I mean, and if you criminalize, you actually are adding an enormous amount of social stress that is going to make that person more vulnerable rather than help them in any way. But you are removing them from their family support system, and if they are women, then you are, you're, or even men, I mean, you see the downstream effects that that has on their family. But we incarcerate in our country, and I understand that Oklahoma has one of the highest rates of incarceration in the country. And so if we're going to incarcerate, and my view is, and people that have a substance use disorder end up incarcerated, and people with an opioid use disorder are also at much higher risk of cycling to a prison or a jail, treat them, treat them, and then your outcomes improve significantly. There's been a lot of work already demonstrated. This is data from England, actually, published uh, two years ago in which they actually uh, initiated everybody that was in a prison in England with buprenorphine, and then they monitored them, and they observed that within three months, they had a 70% reduction in mortality, 7-0. It's very rare to see that very large effect size with many other medications. To the right, it's also a, a, a study that I love, because it is a very simple, okay, the prison or the jail systems are very stigmatized against the use of, um, of medications because for many reasons. One of the things that, that I think is of their concern is that they are afraid that some of them could be diverted. So many researchers, for example, have shown that if you don't do what the, the people in England did, though actually that leads to very much better outcomes overall, but just, just initiate the medication before they are going to be released, one month or one week before, or one day. In that study is one day before they are released, they are giving methadone. That simple intervention. Just before you are released from, from jail, they gave them methadone, and then they follow them at 12 months. And this is the, the difference between in blue those that were given methadone on the day before release versus those that were not given methadone and just referred to treatment. And you can see uh, heroin use in past days is basically close to half that what just this simple intervention. Um, injection drug use is dramatically decreased. And look at non-fatal overdoses, significantly reduced. And again, the opportunity of working with the justice settings right now to actually change the culture, to get them partnership with healthcare systems that can either help them provide the treatment while individuals are in prison or jail, and very importantly, upon release, that these individuals are sustained on treatment. Because if they don't provide that bridge, those individuals are going to be released. 
So we're funding multiple researchers. We're creating a network, just like you create clinical trial networks. We've created a, a network of uh, justice settings, and we're doing this in, in partnership with the Department of, of uh, Justice. So I want to come back again to the issue of the medication, to try to, to put a plug, because in, in terms of, as I was visiting the outpatient clinic, and that sense that there, um, because there was not so much experience on the use of these medications uh, within, within the clinic, how powerful they are. Buprenorphine, partial agonist, it needs to occupy all of the receptors for it to be beneficial. And in fact, at the doses that we give clinically, 12 to 20 milligrams of buprenorphine on a daily basis, you basically are blocking all of the opioid receptors. So these are images, images that basically should have, these are the new opioid receptors, different levels of the level, and this is somewhere about buprenorphine for hours before. And you can no longer see the nuclear receptor because they are bound by the drug. And what you can see though, at 28 hours, the drug has basically started to leave the brain, buprenorphine, so you can start to see the nuclear receptor. At 52 hours, also buprenorphine is starting to leave the brain, and more of it, and you see more. And then at 76 hours, you see basically buprenorphine is no longer occupying these opioid receptors. Now think about what this means. If you are here, you can take all of the heroin, all of the fentanyl that you want. It's not going to bind to those receptors. So the point is that buprenorphine prevents overdose deaths because it's occupying those receptors. So if you take a very potent drug and buprenorphine has extremely high affinity for that neopia receptor, it's not going to basically produce respiratory depression because you are occupying those receptors. And this is at the beauty. You can prevent opioid overdoses by treating with buprenorphine. The key, though, you have it here in front of you is that you need to sustain very high levels. And so one of the questions that we're very interested in the money that we're getting and one of the clinical trials that, that's going to be done as part of the clinical trial network is this extended release for populations. So this is the product by um, basically of Indivio. It comes at two doses, high dose, low dose. And so these are different times in tranquilization. And they get uh, one injection every month. And this is the plasma concentration of buprenorphine, <coughs> at which you actually uh, basically prevent craving and withdrawal. Okay. And that's around two, two to three nanograms per milliliter. We don't know why it's that. Probably it has to be higher to prevent overdoses. Where I predict that actually these extended release populations are going to sustain plasma levels that are going to be significantly higher, that are going to protect the person from relapsing and then also from overdoses. And thereupon, the beauty of these extended release formulations, not just in terms of their being, making it easier for patients to be compliant, but also sustaining plasma levels that are protected. Because if you are taking it on a daily basis, you can see, for example, the first one, the patient may have been okay during the first week, but in this period, they may be at higher risk of relapse. So this is, again, the opportunity of getting engaged in clinical research to test this. We also know that it's not just about medication, and it's also not just about medication or something else. And one of the areas that I'm trying to encourage researchers to look at is actually why don't we combine therapies? So, and I was uh, uh, visiting the laboratory of uh, the transcranial uh, current stimulation and, uh, and very, very elegant work that is going on to try to see could TCS be useful for craving. I mean, and one of the questions that I've been asking myself and basically saying to people, why don't we start testing whether the combination of buprenorphine with TDCS can improve the likelihood of patients uh, retaining treatment because we have 50% relapsing. So what is driving them on relapse? And as I was where we were discussing, one of the things that drives them on relapse is depression. And so by the way, patients that have depression tend to respond, respond better to buprenorphine. So thinking in creative ways about how to use these stimulatory technologies to improve cognitive uh, executive function, to improve interoceptive awareness, to uh, improve um, sensitivity to other rewards, 
to decrease stress reactivity, to actually start to see the dimensionality of addiction and target the intervention with the goal, not just of, I think, this magical thinking, okay, I'm going to cure all of your problems, you're going to stop taking the drug, but improving these dimensions of processes that are contributing to the relapse of drug taking. We also are very interested in the whole area of development of vaccines, and now much more interested in immunotherapy, passive immunization, because it's likely to be much more successful. Why? Because you require very high titers of drugs in the plasma um, uh, of antibodies in order to be able to filter the high doses of drugs that you have in plasma. It's much more challenging than when you have a bacteria because you have much higher content of chemicals. So that's where passive immunization plays an important role. There are researchers working with vaccines and immunotherapies for uh, actually heroin, for fentanyl, and I'm going to sort of say for methamphetamine. And this is very important because right now uh, we don't have anything whatsoever for methamphetamine except for the development of antibodies. They are going on phase two clinical trials and they have been shown to be successful certainly in animal models and to be actually uh, safe in humans. So we are evaluating the extent to which they may be helpful in preventing toxicity when you have patients coming in the emergency department, but ultimately could one be able, if one can extend the life of these monoclonal antibodies, which researchers have been able to do for, for, um, for, for studies that have been targeting uh, monoclonal antibodies for HIV or cancer, if we can start to implement these things for addiction, we may be able to have a treatment. And that brings me to actually the problem that we are here, and you are actually very aware because you are at the essence here. Here is Oklahoma, and I'm going to confess, guys, I'm very, I mean, I was not born in the United States, so I didn't exactly know where Oklahoma was, so I knew <laughs> something around here, but then I went into Google and I found everything in Google, and there is Oklahoma. Oklahoma is very, very high in the and I don't need to tell you that. For we were discussing 29,000 deaths or 28,000, depending on, on which uh, source you look at of deaths with synthetic fentanyls and others. Add methamphetamine and cocaine, 24,000 deaths. And look at how fast they are going. Their DC increases almost as fast as, as synthetic cocaine. And I'm highlighting this because we tend to focus and simplify and say the problem is obvious, the problem is obvious. Yes, we have a serious problem in obvious, but we have a serious problem of drugs in this country. And if we contain, like we contain the prescription obvious, they are basically uh, starting, they're stabilized, and heroin has somewhat stabilized. Now, then comes synthetic obvious. We, we are able, we haven't been able to contain this synthetic obvious, but we're already seeing the rises in methamphetamine. So the question then, when I said it, and we were discussing it last night at dinner too, is what is making this country vulnerable? And I think that tackling that question is fundamental as we move forward. And, and here is your data. I, mean, I was uh, afraid to show it to you because I said, I'm sure they, they know it left and right, but I, it speaks for itself. This is a number of deaths. So it's going up. And we don't have naloxone to reverse those overdoses. We don't have buprenorphine to prevent them. We may have antibodies, but we're working on that. So this is where the HPCD comes to play. To me, in any disease model that we do, prevention is the most <coughs> important thing that we can do. But prevention is not as sexy as many of the other things that we do. Because it's actually, we have many evidence-based prevention interventions that have shown that interventions that target uh, family, that target community, educational system, are actually quite beneficial in helping prevent substance use disorders. But we don't really understand exactly how, nor do we know how to personalize, nor do we know how to revert vulnerability factors. And that's where I basically we come to the HBCD study. We successfully launched the ABCD now it's the time to do the HPCD. So the HPCD follows on the ABCD to actually inici initiate in infancy and to ask that question, how do adverse social environments influence the development of the human brain in ways that are making it vulnerable? Because our vulnerability for substance use disorders, 
or our vulnerability or resilience for certain mental illnesses emerges very early in our development. And to the extent that we can understand patterns or changes in the brain that can alert us that these are happening, we may be able then to do interventions to strengthen it. And I want to end up with this slide because I think that many times we have data in front of us and we just keep on ignoring it. When we ask the question, I mean, what is making us vulnerable? And I think that this, this very simple study, and it's not the only one that has been done documenting the importance of social factors in vulnerability of the, uh, taking drugs, but it actually shows it in a very, very eloquent way. It's a study from the intramural program, the Neuro and Javin Hachaham's Hachaham laboratory, actually does it. And it does it in addressing this. I mean, I actually, look at this photograph there. It's a photograph by James Natway, who's a time special report. And what caught my eye about the, um, that, that figure was not per se the um, poverty of the place, but the horrific isolation of this individual. I mean, if you look at it from that perspective, and sort of says, what is it that addiction does? It isolates people. And when you think about what is it that makes people become despair, is that when they become basically isolated from any group, when they no longer have a need. So these researchers did a very simple um, variation of a study that we've been doing for years. You press a lever, if you're a rat, then you get the drug. And drugs, rats will press the lever to get cocaine or heroin. And I think if you don't have anything else to do, of course, you'll press the lever and you'll throw it. I mean, we are all going to be vulnerable if we are put in a, a little cage like that. But he gave these animals a choice, which is what we all have, to a lesser or greater extent. He got a choice. You could press the lever and get the drug, heroin, and, some of the, and so different drugs, where one of them heroin and the other one is methamphetamine. And in, but there the was a second lever. And if you press that second lever, the animal got the opportunity to have a social interaction with another rat. And when the animal was given the choice between taking the drug or the social interaction, and now these were animals that have been exposed repeatedly to the drug. So they were administering the drug. But when they were given a choice, they stopped taking the drug. Or they stopped taking the medicine. And only when the reward, the social reward was penalized. How did they penalize the reward? In one of them is they put an electric grid so that when the animal pressed the social reward, they receive an electric shock. In that case, basically heroin taking way back. Or methamphetamine taking way back. And in this case, they did another, uh, another punishment of the social reward. You press the letter for the social reward and you don't get it immediately, you delay it. And that also significantly increased drug consumption. So if we learn something as simple as this, and we say we want to actually prevent people from relapsing and achieving recovery, we need to ensure that we give them social support systems that are meaningful. Because otherwise they're going to be taken wrong. And we extend it to the notion of if as a country we're very vulnerable for taking drugs, and we want to introduce systems, a uh, structure that will provide resilience, we need to provide the ability to have these individuals build meaningful social relationships. Because that's likely to be one of the most powerful factors that can provide resilience against substance use disorders. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. We have to move on. That's what he said to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be the bad guy. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Volkow is very tight on the timeline. Uh, I know you probably have a ton of questions. I'm, I'm very sorry, but we'll, we'll, we'll have to move on. I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, I'm sure you can get the sense uh, the amount of energy and the amount of uh, uh, vision that is really at the head of uh, the National Institute of Drug Use. Thank you.